CFR Network, CFR Sports. Welcome back to the lab. Special guests, many, many thousands of miles away. I welcome author, Call of Sports commentator, presenter, um, combat sports enthusiast, Michael the Voice Chevero. Welcome to the broadcast, sir. How are we? Thank you. Very nice to be on here with you finally. Thanks for having me. You're most welcome. We, we, we got it done. You know, there's, a, there's a, a, a few different time zones and some water that separates us, but being diligent and looking at schedules, we've, we, we got it done. We got it done. We are here. We're going to have fun. Definitely, definitely. So um, please, for anybody who may not know who you are, sir, give, give, give them a little brief overview, sir, a brief introduction. Well, I am the, currently the, the commentator of One Championship, uh, which, if you don't know, is the largest martial arts organisation in the world. I guess there are, there are really, you know, two major martial arts organisations on the planet, UFC and One Championship. Uh, you could consider us the king of MMA in the East and uh, UFC the king of MMA in the West. And uh, I've been doing that for the last four years. And uh, I'm talking to you right now from Singapore. We, we've got a whole bundle of shows coming up uh, after a circuit breaker being lifted here in Singapore that uh, effectively we had no shows after the last couple of months. It's good to be back in the saddle. Excellent. And I was going to get into that. And that was an excellent segue because I think we've all been waiting after the, the epic TNT cards that took place. We were like... That was an excellent showing. What else can you feed us kind of thing? And then, you know, the woman's um, card was cancelled, etc. Can you go into some detail? What, what, what was that in regards to the circuit breaker? Why that event couldn't take place? Yeah, that was exactly why. I mean, we were all planned to have the Empower card on May the 3rd. Um, I was here up until April the 30th. And uh, then it, it got cancelled because Singapore... Um, had a, a spike in COVID cases, decided to shut down a lot of the country, shut down live entertainment and, and group gatherings, etc. So we had no shows in May, no shows in June. Uh, we're back up and running now, though, with uh, you know plenty of shows planned uh, end of July, obviously, and throughout August. And the Empower card is going to go ahead, I assure you. Uh, the date of that will be announced very, very shortly. Um, but it is happening. I'm, I'm glad to see that. That'll be the eight women's Adam Waite Grand Prix kicking off. And it'll be an all-women's card as well. I think we'll have other world title fights on there too, both from, uh, you know, mixed martial arts and from our one Super Series striking. But, uh, you know, uh, the, the cases have come down in Singapore and the testing is really heavy over here. The bubbles are unquarantined. All the athletes are quarantined. We are subjected to uh, COVID tests every day. Uh, we are isolated from our, our pickups from the hotel to the arena and back. We're not allowed to leave the hotel. It's all very strict. Um, it's all very difficult, but we are doing what we need to do to keep everyone safe yes. and healthy and make these shows go ahead for the fans. That's the most important thing, as you say. It, it's, a, it's a combined effort, you know, uh, these bubbles, um, being diligent and being safe. It, it's, it's, it's taxing enough you know, organizing and being a part of an event, never mind being the athlete trying to sort of compete in that event, having this additional sort of shell over that must be difficult to say the least to, to, to mentally get yourself into that space. Well, yeah, we're the first promotion, we're the first sports organization in the world to do empty arena shows. Uh, when the pandemic was just, you know, really starting to, to hit last year, we did a, a show here in Singapore on February 28. And instead of canceling the show, we decided to do a closed door show. No audience, officials, commentators, athletes only. And everyone else looked at that. And it was a real litmus test, not only for the Singapore government and for one championship, but for other organizations around the world. They saw that that could work. Mm -hmm. And then in the following weeks after that, we saw, uh, you know, empty stadiums in, in soccer, you know, for the EPL and Serie A and Bundesliga and MLS and you know, NBA and uh, WWE, all the big sports organizations, UFC, yes. took the lead from that because one championship did it successfully. Uh, it's been a lot to adjust to even, you know, from a commentary perspective, not being circle side, being upstairs, being at a, you know, this Friday night, I'll be at a completely separate desk 
to my co-commentator, which in itself is going to be you know difficult and strange. But again, you're a professional and sometimes you've got to juggle things around to make it happen. And as a professional, you, you learn what to do and you take the advice and the guidance of your expert producers and um, directors. And we're a fantastic team here at One and we know we're going to knock it out of the park every time. 100%. Who will be, is it going to be uh, Rich or the Dragon with you to the, um, on this up and coming event? It'll be the Dragon with Chilston. Uh, Rich Franklin is over in the US at the moment uh, doing some scouting work over there. There is still talk about one championship potentially doing a show in the US sometime this year. Uh, so Mitch and I uh, will be teaming up on Friday for, for this show and for, of course, all the shows coming up through August. Excellent, excellent. So mixed martial arts, combat fans and connoisseurs, we have um, an additional bit of um, entertainment for us. We're not just relying on potentially LFA, Bellator, UFC, or even um, Bare Knuckle FC, which has um, had an interesting card with Paige and um, the other young lady. Um, we have some some meat and potatoes, a little bit of gravy, and some vegetables to go along with it as well. <laughs> I don't know who we're calling the vegetables. Uh, <laughs> plenty of meat and gravy and a lot of potatoes, that's for sure. <laughs> without a doubt, without a doubt. Um, English. That's just English of you. This is it. I've got to interject that. You know, I've got to highlight that element. So. <laughs> um, oh, I was expecting a little bit of blood sausage or black pudding or something oh, like that. Well, that, that's further north, that is. You know, haggis, black pudding. I mean, we <laughs> do have it down here, but that's more of a northern delicacy, that is. <laughs> It's it. I haven't had it in years. I have partook in um, such a, a a delicacy. I would say it's a delicacy as well. I mean, blood. No, it's not something for me. I had it once. Um, you know, I've been to England uh, maybe four or five times commentating for Bama back in the day. Birmingham was one of the cities I went to, and uh, but I think I had black pudding one time only. It was with breakfast. It was a, a, a like a patty that yes. big, uh, very very salty, very yes. strong. I think I only had half of it, and it was in uh, Newcastle, if I remember correctly. Sounds about right. Definitely the right location for, for the... How did you find... Did Birmingham welcome you well, sir? How did you find your first time in Birmingham? You know, I liked Birmingham. I heard from everybody that Birmingham was a very industrial town and, and you know, not as scenic as some of the other places around England. I liked it. The, the venue, um, I can't remember the name. It was on the beautiful river there, the sports venue, the indoor venue. Oh, yes. Where we did Birmingham. Yes, the ICC. That's it. Yes. Uh, it was it was lovely. And uh, the people of Birmingham were lovely. And they turned out in force for Bama. And we, we had a great card. And I think it might have been on Spike TV in the UK back then when we did it. And it was a good good rating show and uh, had a lot of fun. Perfect. Perfect. How I, lo I love the UK. I love England. And, uh, you know, the only problem is, of course, not a problem for me because I'm Italian by birth and uh, by heritage. And... We just beat you guys at the Euros, oh. you know, at Wembley. <laughs> at Wembley. So I'm very happy. I'm sorry to all you Englishmen who are still whining and complaining, but yeah. the cheese boys did it. Indeed. Look, the, the, be the better team won, you know, the better team won. Let's pull it, let's pull it that way. It's a game, you know, national pride is on the line. Unfortunately, the penalties didn't, didn't uh, materialise in the fashion it could have. But, you know, there's always... Well, what do you when you put your last penalty taker as a 19 year Thank old you. who's never taken a penalty why doesn't someone like Raheem Sterling, Sterling step up and take that penalty is beyond me but another conversation for another broadcast <laughs> you highlight an excellent point and many people have said the same thing it, it, in the strategy of the coach Mr Southgate doing that it just didn't seem... He even gave you a Jorginho missed penalty. He's only missed five now in his entire career. We gave you that. Mm. Yes. Onwards and upwards, sir. And congratulations to the whole nation of, uh, of Italy. <laughs> you didn't expect this to turn into a football podcast, did you? <laughs> well, I thought there might be an element on that, sir. I know you're very um, well-versed in all sort of sporting areas. So, yes. Uh, uh, you know, I originally started my career covering soccer as we call it in australia football and then i was co-founding editor of what turned out to be australasia's largest uh, soccer magazine soccer international magazine 
And I actually traveled to the 94 and 98 World Cups. I covered both of those. I used to commentate soccer, um, and it's still my favorite sport. So when it comes to football, particularly the, the World Cup and the Euro Cups and the Italian yeah. national team, I'm still very fervent and passionate. Ah, for me, I kind of fell out of love with, with the old uh, soccer slash football in the sort of mid-90s when it, it really just became about money. It wasn't necessarily about the talent. Well, it was about the talent because the money bought the talents. It sounds to me again like the blame there is on Gareth Southgate, mid-90s. I'm thinking Euro 96. Six. I missed a penalty shot from Southgate. Yeah. You fell out of love with English football. You see how it yeah. all comes around? It totally does, sir. Uh, and with your excellent memory, you brought it all together. <laughs> put it together for you let's yes. move on anyway we won't talk yes. anymore football let's move yeah. on yes no more foosball so as you alluded to before um february we had the first closed event how has this whole as i have dubbed it the zombie apocalypse how has that affected you outside of the the, the professional side on a personal level how has that affected you have you been able to rise like a phoenix out of the ashes or Definitely rose like a phoenix out of the ashes, but it's been difficult because Australia, where I live, of course, has some of the strictest yeah. COVID laws in the world. And I think it's pretty much well known that we continually go into lockdown. Uh, just two days ago, we came out of our fifth lockdown since the pandemic began. Um, but more than that, every time I've traveled here to Singapore and had to go back to Australia, every time I've got to do two weeks in hotel quarantine. So since October alone, I've spent a total of 12 weeks in quarantine, locked in a room by myself, unable to leave. Three months of my life wow. since October, unable to see my family, to see my kids, etc. Uh, that has been the most difficult thing. Now, when you say you're locked in a hotel, I have spoken to a few um, athletes over there. And if you're lucky enough, I guess, depending on how big of an athlete you are, you will get like a nice sort of apartment versus literally a hotel room is it does no, that... uh, no no it, it you know it's 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 random it's really random luck of the draw what you get mm -hmm. uh is what you're given there are no exemptions you could apply for an exemption but 99.9 .9 of the time they're not given they weren't given to the australian open tennis players you know it doesn't matter who you are and when i say you're locked down in your room you're locked in your room you cannot open the door and stick your head out. There's cops, there's police waiting right there saying back in your room. You know, um, it, no one comes into your room to clean it. Uh, it. It's all, they'll bring you one change of linen over two weeks and you make your bed yourself and, you know, keep your room clean yourself and you can't go anywhere. Uh, you can order food in if you want. They deliver it to your door. They knock, you wait 30 seconds till they leave. You pick up the food, close the door. Uh, you get COVID tested four times throughout your stay. So it's, it's, it's you know, very strict. And it's right till 11.59 p.m. on the 14th day when you can leave. So it, it's it's difficult knowing that every time yeah. I go back, I've got to go back to there, that I'm literally, you know, a 10, 15 minute drive from my family and, and I can't see them. That must be um, awful. Is there any physical exercise? Are you allowed like, out like prisoners are for, for at least an hour's worth no, of exercise? No, 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 not a breath of fresh air, no. That is... I think that's a bit much that is i mean I, I understand the process and what the what they're trying to achieve government governmental wise and obviously uh, health and safety wise but that it, as human beings we are you know we are social types you know we we have to have some form of physicality we need fresh air in our system like what are we are we isn't that more Detrimental. No, I, got, I got one hotel room in Adelaide that had a balcony, so I could actually go on my own balcony to get a breath of fresh air. But all the other hotel rooms, as you know, most hotel rooms around the world just don't have balconies and yeah. don't have opening windows. And so you're stuck in a room, um, you know, with the AC or the heating, whatever you've got for, for two weeks solid. And um, you've just got to keep your sanity, get some sort of routine. Yeah. TV shows, read books, jog up and down the spot, try and do a bit of exercise, uh, do writing, do whatever you can. And um, 
yeah, see out the two weeks. It's it's hard, you know. It's, it's, I, I hear people complaining after they do one session of it. And like I said, I've done three months worth. <laughs> I'm going to go back now and do another two weeks worth. And I'm, you know, quarantining here in Singapore at the moment as well, only allowed to go to the venue and back for the show. So that's certainly the most the most difficult thing. And, you know, even being vaccinated, I've been vaccinated, you know, and uh, it's, it's still tough. It's still the rules. Yeah. Trustfully, being optimistic, cop always half full. You know, we can see the apex. We can see some light of sorts. You know, and you know, what the, cup, the cup really half full is though. And, and and I'm not don't don't think I'm complaining. I'm I'm um, elaborating and informing you guys as to you know what we're going through, what the process is, as you asked, how it's affected me. And I'm certainly not complaining because there are a lot of people over the last year or so, year and a half almost who are in a very bad way, who have lost their jobs, lost houses, yes. um, you know, lost relatives, lost friends. And I'm fortunate that I'm, I'm healthy. My family's healthy. I'm working. I'm earning money. I'm doing a job that I love. And uh, that puts me in a, you know, a very, very fortunate, uh, God-blessed position. Um, so really, I, you know, I don't complain. I, I, I bite the bullet. I go through with it. I do it. And I think the light at the end of the tunnel is this is not going to last all the time. It's not going to last forever. It's going to come to an end, you know, soon, hopefully. But meanwhile, my family is safe. They're healthy. I'm healthy. And, uh, you know, I, I'm working. That's a lot more than, uh, unfortunately, a lot of other people can say. You are 100% correct. That's why we always every day have to count our blessings and, you know, tr try and move forward and make the best out of every situation. Every day should be a learning day. I agree. So let, let's let's rewind time, sir. Let's rewind time. Let's jump in the old DeLorean with Marty and Duck. And um, let's go back in time before there was a The Voice. Um, where did we grow up and where was we raised? Uh, let's go back. Load the flux capacitor. It yes. was in uh, Melbourne, Melbourne, Australia. Uh, born in 1975. And, uh, you know, my, my dad was an, an immigrant from Italy uh, who worked in a factory and later owned that factory and made shoes and a uh, very hardworking man. His hands were always black uh, from all that, you know, made the shoes by hand every, every single day um, while he was working for such a long career. And, uh, you know, hard taskmaster, but I learned a lot of very good lessons from him. And my mum was very caring and nurturing and, uh, you know, was always a, a big supporter of whatever endeavor I applied myself to. She was always there encouraging me and, you know, still is. Um, and uh, it was a, a fairly normal uh, background. Um, you know, there were, there were difficulties to overcome as a child being you know, an overweight kid and, you know, the bullying that went with that. And I think that a lot of that uh, pushed me in it, uh, to achieve what I achieved, to to transcend that genre and not just be considered as a, you know, a, a fat kid, but, you know, to, to, to make people take notice of me for something else. And what that thing became was my, my voice and my writing. And uh, when I was 15 or 16 years old, I did my first commentary just as a means of, you know, wagging school one day uh, to commentate some athletics. And from then I sort of recognized that I had a talent for it. And uh, one thing led to another. And you know, eventually I made a career off it. Excellent, excellent. And clearly from what, from what I've read, some from what you're elaborating on, you use the adversity to your advantage. Definitely. And I, I think that uh, when, you, when you come against adversity in life, you can either, you know, it's a fork in the road. Yeah. You're either going to let you down or you're going to use it like you said, to your advantage to, to pull you up. And I certainly got down at times and, you know, we all do. I'm sure a lot of people have, have been bullied and have encountered adversity through their lives. And do you let it get you down and do you use it as an excuse? Is it an excuse for the rest of your life to say, I was bullied as a 12 year old, as a 15 year old. That's why I'm, you know, sitting on the couch, achieving nothing with my life. That's why I'm sad and depressed and going nowhere with my life. Or do you say, no, I'm not going to let that happen to me. I'm going to show those guys, I'm going to show everyone that I'm not some sad case kid that was picked on and bullied on. And hell, man, I'm still bullied. You know, anyone who's in the public spotlight gets bullied. Exactly. I get bullied on Twitter, bullied on Facebook. You know, people criticize your commentary. You know, people hate on you and, and, and people you know, write terrible things online. But 
do I let that get me down and depressed and upset and say, well, maybe I am terrible. Maybe I am horrible. No, I'm like, well, I'm just going to keep striving to be better and yes. be better than I was. The only person I, had, I need to prove to that I'm better than is my, myself from last week. Yes. So when I do the next commentary for one championship, my aim is to be better than my last commentary. You know, my aim is to be a better person now than I was a year ago, than I was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. My aim as a father to my two my two sons is to be a better father today than I was yesterday, a better husband to my wife than I was yesterday. And that's what you need to prove to, to no one else, but to yourself that you are constantly improving yourself. Yes. Because if you don't improve, you remain stagnant. And mm -hmm. it's a piece of advice I give to everybody, especially a lot of up and coming podcasters and broadcasters and you know commentators who will upload stuff on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube or whatever. And they'll do a podcast or a commentary and look at me, look at me. And they're 19, 20 years old. And, you know, months later, they'll upload another podcast and a, a commentary and look at me, look at me. But nothing's changed. Mm. Okay, they haven't learned anything. You're, you're doing the same thing as you were six months ago, as you were a year ago. And that's fine and dandy if you just want people to click the like button. But if you want to make a career out of it, you've got to improve. You've got to be better than what you were six months ago. So although you might start at the bottom level, yes. at level Z, you know, in six months' time, try to get to level Y. Six months later, try to get to level W. Don't start level Z because you're a YouTube sensation because that's all you'll ever be is, a, a, you know, click a thousand likes, a million, a million likes. That, that's it. You won't make a career off that. You won't get any satisfaction off that. It's very fleeting satisfaction to get likes on social media, but you've always got to try and elevate yourself and improve yourself. And if you're watching yourself now or listening to yourself now, and you're no different than you were years ago or months ago, you're doing something wrong. Totally, totally. The it's, you have... Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice doesn't make perfect. Improved practice aims towards perfection. That's what it is. I can keep practicing the same thing over and over again. If I do the same thing, I'm not going to go anywhere. So practice doesn't make perfect. Improved practice leads you towards perfection. Indeed. And practice makes you proficient. Perfection is something Indeed. that we, we we talk about and it's, an, it's a nice word, but there's only one man. It's never <laughs> exactly. It's, it's never unattainable. Attain you know, I, I just wrote a book called The Commentators, which you can pre-order now. And I speak to some of the best commentators in the world about this very subject. Have you ever done a perfect commentary? And I'm asking guys like Peter Drury, who's probably the best football commentator on the planet. Uh, John Murray from the BBC in the UK. Yeah. Uh, Scully, maybe the greatest announcer of all time. You know, who they named uh, uh, Dana Scully on the X-Files. They named her after Vin Scully. He's in the book. And I ask all these people about perfection. They all say they will never achieve the perfect commentary because perfection does not exist. It doesn't. There's no such thing as perfection. You can strive to do your very, very, very best, and you should, but don't have the expectation of perfection. Have the expectation of doing your, your finest. Yes. You know, your... your, your, your with your, your God-given abilities and, you know, continually practicing and improving those abilities. But, um, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, if you're going to aim for perfection, you're always going to fall short. Totally, totally. I mean, it's always good to have big dreams and aspirations, you know, definitely shoot for the stars, you know, try and be limitless in that respect. But you've got to be a realist to a point. You, you've got to have short term, long term, medium goals, and you've got to put mechanisms and things in place to achieve those goals. And you need to be persistent. And that's, that's, that's the main thing. You know, there's two things I think that really got me far in my career was persistency and ignorance and i know you think ignorance how does how does ignorance get you anywhere but i was ignorant of how to commentate i taught myself how to commentate i never achieved any more than a high school you know graduation i was ignorant i didn't know anything from a broadcasting school so i didn't know the rules of commentary yes. i didn't know the in and out from the technical side of commentary i was ignorant to that i simply loved watching old wrestling gorilla monsoon Ooh. bobby the brain Heenan, Bobby <laughs> ventura these were the guys i grew up on yes. and i took my key from them you know i took my key from them and i was ignorant of everything else and that ignorance 
allowed me to develop my own unique way of commentating, my own brand, my own product. And that product yeah. has got me to where I am today. And it's been working for me since I was, you know, started commentating on television as a, as a 20 year old. So, you know, and I was persistent. I, I, I never knocked back an opportunity. I never let people say you're not good enough, although I got told a long time ago, and you know, you're not good enough, you won't ever make it in TV, you haven't got the right voice, you haven't got the right look, you haven't got the right style, but I got here. This you know, so persistence and ignorance. Mm, determination, consistency is one of the keys to success. Um, being dogmatic in the belief in oneself to strive to achieve. And as you say, look at you now, you know, you've had people say, oh, you, 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 You've got something there, Michael, but it's it's not for us. You know, you didn't allow that to say, I'm going to allow that situation and that knockback to define my career progression and career direction. You took, you know, everything in your own hands and your own destiny in your own hands and you drove forward. Of course, and you never rest on your laurels. You know, it's not a, it's not a case of, well, once you get there, plant your flag and, and that's it, you're there. You've got to keep working for it because there's always you know, other people that are scratching and clawing and trying to get their way up the mountain. So if you're on top of the mountain, uh, you know, you've got to keep working to stay there. You know, that's where it's the coldest, you know, on top of the mountain. Yeah. You're closer to the sun, but it's the coldest on top of the mountain. So you've got to work hard to, to, to you know, to stay on top and you know, keep improving yourself again and, you know, practice with improvement with improvement practice making you proficient and a good thing as well to have would be to have a wide solid support circle and when i say wide i don't necessarily mean you need to have hundreds of these people i'm think i'm saying be be um look wider than you would necessarily look for that's the potential support that you can draw from you know, the thing is that my mum taught me when I was young that manners don't cost you anything. Mm -hmm. And I've always believed in that. When I speak to people, I, I'm polite, I'm friendly, I work hard, you know, uh, do as I'm instructed by people that know more than me, producers and directors. And, uh, you know, and around me, I've got a very supportive wife. And as I said, supportive parents, supportive friends, uh, you know, who understand that it's a, it's a lifestyle that they are not accustomed to. It's not a traditional job being a commentator. You're away a lot. You're traveling a lot. Strange hours. You know, you're being exposed to to a lot of the public that, you know, people commenting that you don't know. And this is something that some people find difficult to to deal with. Uh, you know, and that there's two, there's, you know, it's two Michael Chevallos. There's the one you see on television, you know, and there's the, the private one. Yes. And, you know, people that don't have your back or aren't around you for the right reason sometimes can't distinguish between those two people. You know, and I always, you know, I always said to to my wife when we started dating, I said, look, when you look at my Facebook page, my social media page, you've got to understand that I use those primarily for work. Yes. You know, it's the product, it's the brand Michael Chevello that I'm pushing. Yes. Um, but, you know, and I said to my friends, I go, that's not me that you know in private. That's the voice. You know, that's the brand, that's the good night Irene, the big kibosh, the boom shakalaka, the, you know, all that sort of stuff. I don't walk around talking like that. You know, I'm not like that. In, I'm, I'm, I'm quiet in real life. Yeah. You take me to a party and I'm not going around saying, oh, good night Irene, boom shakalaka, big kibosh. Oh, that's not me. I'm happy to stand in the corner and, you know, be the quiet guy because yeah. I'm not that outwardly social. Mm. So, you know, it, it's... um. It's uh, important, as you said, to have a good support group around you that can realize that about you, that you can detach from yes. one world and go to the other and vice versa. You've got to have a good support team around you at work as well because my my great support team here at One Championship from our producers, our directors, our EPs, my co-commentators, you know, ring announcers, everyone I work with, they help to bring out the voice, you know, and that's what helps it come alive during the shows. Glad you said that because it, you, you, you've again eloquently highlighted the difference between personal persona slash private persona and the public persona. People sure strangely enough think whatever they see on from a, a, a news commentator or someone on television is that is who they are. 
And unfortunately, you know, we have to put on certain personas when you're at work, you have to put on a work persona. If you work in an office, you know, you cannot be your natural self. Unfortunately, you have to tweak things. It's, it's very true. You know, it's like um, a lot of the comedians that I meet, uh, you know, lovely guys, great conversation, but it's not like they laugh out loud funny every second. Yeah. You know, they turn that on when they're on stage or when they're on TV, when they're doing an interview, when they're doing a show, they turn it on. You know, away from that, regular, normal, you know, normal, normal guys. And I've met so many celebrities, you know, over the years and interviewed them and spent time with them. And, you know, it, it rings true for all of them. They've got the persona and they've got the private side. And the private side is very normal and, you know, very polite and very respectful. And you know, I struggle to name any celebrity really that has not been that um been that way and uh, you know it's 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 the way it is and like you said it applies to everyone i mean you guys watching this listening to this i'm sure you're not the same at your office as you are at home you know i'm sure you're, you're if you're working behind the counter somewhere that's not the personality you have at a party so it's um you, you know again coming back to your original question that's why you need the support group around you that can understand that definitely and nurture and uh, as you grow and as your support circle grow and team grow you know where it's a symbiotic relationship it's a fair exchange you know you're giving and receiving and vice versa um that is how we as a community <laughs> you know this speaking about it in a wider sense this is how we can build and create communities by being supportive, not looking at, you know, the 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 more West's kind of fast pace. Um, it's all about self, you know, very quick gratification. You know, you get a lot more gratification from me personally, from helping people. As you say, manners costs nothing. Opening doors for of people, course. you know, saying please and thank you, good day, good night. These are the values. Course, you know, always before, like I said, good, good manners are free and that will carry you very very far in life and that transitions perfectly into one championship respect to honor <laughs> the, these are the things again as as a a global society these are the attributes and aspirations we should be seeking to respect each other yeah it's you know it's one of the beautiful things about working at one championship it, it may sound like a, a brand line to a lot of people on a lot of people honor integrity respect but it permeates all the staff at one i've never worked in an environment in my life where i see everyone happy and i don't hear anyone complain that's really strange mm -hmm. i mean i've done office jobs in the past um, you know, I've worked all over the world, various TV networks and organizations. And, you know, there's always an undercurrent of people unhappy with something, complaining about something, you know, moaning and sighing and rolling of the eyes. You don't see it here at one. And there's so many people. It's such a big production behind the scenes. I mean, when we are flying around, you know, doing shows pre-pandemic, of course, uh, we'd be flying like 150 people to a different city all the time for a show. It's just crazy. And everyone's happy. Everyone's upbeat. Everyone's a cog in the wheel doing their job, proud and passionate to do it. And uh, so that whole, you know, everyone treats each other with, with respect. There's there's no male dominance. There's so many females working at one championship, which is great. And, mm -hmm. you know, in very high up positions as well, a lot of females, there, there's, there's people from all races, all colors, all creeds, you know, heavily involved in all production and behind the scenes and it's 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 a utopian beautiful working community i would 100 percent agree and um special mentions to the uh, the pr team as well at one who are doing a tremendous job um we are one as the strap line is you know we we, we are all different you know in in physicality in in melatonin and, and pigmentation in our skin, etc., uh, cultures, customs, but ultimately we are custodians of this of this plane of existence. Um, everyone bleeds, man. Everyone bleeds the same color blood. You know what I'm saying? Everyone's the same, and you know, you know, I like that unity here at one. And like I said, you just see your work colleagues and know that everyone's super busy. I mean, these guys work hard, man, long hours 
hard work in the heat of Southeast Asia, often oppressive heat outside, you, you know, out and about and you're sweating, but they do it with a smile on their face and they're happy to do it. And, you know, they're doing it well and they're doing it slick and they're doing it every, every time they're always looking to improve. It's not let's sit on our laurels as, you know, broadcast to over 150 countries and getting these high ratings and millions around the world watching. Let's keep trying to improve the product. And again, the next show coming up, you know, this week and over the next few weeks, you're going to see improvements, stuff you haven't seen before. And that's because we're not sitting back thinking, no, we, 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 we're good. Yeah. You know, we, we've got down, just keep going. Same old, same old. Same. No, we can do better. We can do better. We can do better. Let's, let's do more. Let's do better. And it's always, you know, being uh, you know drilled into us let's let's do better let's improve and it's a great thing what was your experience on doing the uh, the three cards on the t on tnt i didn't i i didn't um i i loved it uh four cards oh was it four um it was four four shows on tnt um i really enjoyed it uh i, I suppose everyone knows that the the tnt2 and tnt3 were pre-recorded so we actually did all those on one day we did TNT one was live, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then TNT two was recorded straight after that. And TNT three was recorded straight after that. And then uh, TNT four was live. So, you know, doing three shows in one day, which is how the last batch of shows was done. Uh, and the Dungal show as well um, was, was, was a challenge. Uh, something I'm used to from the old K1 dream days where we do dynamite cards that had like 18 to 21 fights on them that went for eight, nine hours. So I was used to it. Uh, it was a challenge for a lot of the guys though, because they're, they're, they're long days and yeah. camera men carrying cameras for hours. And, you know, Mitch getting used to doing the long hours as my co-commentator talking for a long time. It's certainly a challenge to keep that energy up, yeah. but uh, we, we made it, it was a lot of fun. You know, it was a good buzz to, to go on TNT. Definitely, <clears throat> and the I grew up with TNT shows. You know, I grew up um, in my you know in my early twenties uh, watching WCW Nitro, and that was on TNT. So for me, as a wrestling fan, to be on you know, TNT following wrestling AEW now with the great Jim Ross and Tony yes. Schiavone again, two guys I grew up with. I mean, it was a huge thrill. You are reading my mind, sir. I was just going to transition into the old WWF days. Um, I was a um, a keen purveyor of the old um, Hulk Hogan, Warlord, Slick, the uh, <laughs> the manager, um, Jim the Anvil, Neidhart. You know, let's they were, my, they were my years. That, that was it. It was nineteen eighty five. So f first wrestling I ever watched was nineteen eighty five. Uh, I want to say March thirty first. I was sitting in the lounge room with my mum. My mum allowed me to stay up late one night. I was 10, nine, uh, nine years old, just about to turn 10. My mom, I got home from school and mum said to me, she was looking at the paper, the TV guy, she goes, there's something on TV tonight you might be interested in. WrestleMania, Wrestle... And I looked at her, oh, WrestleMania. She goes, do you want to watch it? I go, all right, I've never seen wrestling. Put it on, beamed to me from a magical faraway place called madison square garden yeah i hear this booming voice like a human foghorn hello everybody you know welcome to the extravagance of all time wrestlemania it's this guy called gorilla monsoon yes i'm in love yeah i'm in love this is music to my ears first matches tito santana versus executioner Ooh. and then after that comes uh, Special Delivery Jones against King Kong Bundy, who terrified me, and Bundy beats yeah. him in nine seconds. I remember after that match, there was a commercial break, and I was taping the show on the old VCR video. Yes. And during the commercial break, I rewound to watch that nine-second match again because I couldn't believe that one man could squash another in nine seconds. <laughs> you know, and then the main event, Ali was there, Liberace was there, Hulk Hogan, Orndorff, who just passed away recently, God bless, yes. and Mr. T and Rowdy Roddy Piper, Piper and Cowboy Bob Orton and Jimmy Superfly Snooker. Yes. And so from 1985 to around about 1993, 94, that was my, you know, yeah. WrestleMania 1 to, to 9. That was my golden era of wrestling, man. That was my child childhood memories. And um, I'll you know what? Wait one moment. I'll show yes. you how much I love those days. Yes. Let me get something. 
<laughs> I think we're 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 pretty similar in regards to the 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 start and then the end period. I just bought these recently. How much do I love wrestling from those periods? I bought a whole collection of these. Whoa. Demolition. Recently, which I'm traveling, traveling with. Look at these. <laughs> oh, the million this, dollar man, Ted DiBiase. This is oh. my childhood. Yes, indeed. All I right, remember. And, uh, all these old magazines. Look, Elizabeth, I was in love with. Yes. Uh, so, sensational so Seri for me. Sensational Seri for me. Yeah. Look at that Hulk Hogan steel yeah. cage match against Bundy. Yes. Okay. I'll throw a Mad Magazine in there. But this is my, you know, this is my reading. I bought, yeah. I bought like a hundred of these old magazines uh, on eBay that I found, and this takes me back to my childhood. So yeah. that was, you know, that was that was it for me, man. That was, I grew up loving that stuff, and I still go back and watch those years, and I still love listening to Gorilla Monsoon, who was my idol, my inspiration, with Jesse Ventura, with Bobby the Brain Heenan, and, yes. and you know, I love Vince McMahon as a commentator. I thought he was awesome as well, and you know, they're the guys that. I learned from, they were my teachers. Mm -hmm. Again, ignorance. No one ever told me you couldn't commentate like that for real, on real sports, on real TV. Yeah. When I started commentating Fox Sports in Australia as a 21 year old, I was doing wrestling style commentary. Mm. No one ever told me you couldn't do that, but I did it, I made yes. it my own, you know, and, 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 and people embraced it. Yes. You know, so I still. Oh yeah. Foundation stuff yeah. right there, Michael. Yes, totally. Yeah. At what point, because for me as a youngster watching that SummerSlam, the Survivor Series, when they brought that out, my, my mother, my sisters were all saying, Noble, you know this stuff is, um, you know it's fake, right? You know it's scripted. And I'd say, no, it isn't. It's real. And I would defend it. And I think it got to, I think it was like 92 or 93 when I started to grow up a little bit more and I was like, there's no way these people, you know, you'd be charging at the ropes and uh, yeah, you know, this, this is actually scripted, you know. You know? I, I, to me, that's, it's a bigger thing than finding out Santa Claus isn't real. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. I remember, I cannot remember the year that I found out it, it wasn't real, that it was all scripted. I, I really can't remember. And I'm assuming that it took a while. It's a beautiful thing because for a long time, I thought it was real. Yeah. And, it's a shame these days that when you go online to read about wrestling, everyone is writing from the perspective that they know it's scripted. And there's no more kayfabe, as they would say in yes. wrestling, you know, where they stick to character. And you know that's why I love reading this stuff, because the writing in here, mm -hmm. from the journalists in here, it's all, it's all written in, 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 it's all in kayfabe. Yeah. You know, you're, you're believing these storylines that really these guys hated each other. And exactly. these guys you know, really looked like that and acted like that in real life. The million dollar man, Ted DiBiase, was this multi-millionaire <laughs> evil tycoon. You know, Hulk Hogan was the all-American all taking vitamins. You know what I'm saying? Ultimate Warrior was a rambling, crazy, strong man. Yes. You believed all that. Yes. You know, and and that was such a beautiful part of my, my, my childhood. And it helped me become a really good storyteller, I think, in the fight game, in commentating fights. And you've got to be a storyteller when you're a commentator. If we don't have stories, what do we have? Because that's how you emotionally engage people. You know, we'll have production meetings here at one, myself, Rich Franklin, Mitch Chilston, and our production team. And the cards will be announced to us. We'll know the weeks before you guys know them. And they'll say, what's our storyline here? And all major promotions do this. And it's not like we're scripting it because you can't possibly script an outcome. But it's like, what's your storyline? Why should, let's say, uh, why should Christian Lee fight Eddie Alvarez? Now, if they're going to be matched up together, we need to think, wh why? Why are they matched together? What's the storyline here? Yeah. Is it because, you know, Eddie Alvarez wants to prove he's still the man? Is it because, you know, Christian Lee's beaten everyone else, but Eddie Alvarez is the last name he's got to beat before he cleans up all the legends? Is it a passing of the torch? You know, how do we pitch it? What's the story we go with? Because those are the stories that turn into our online videos, yes. our press conferences, our media releases, turn into the, the, on fight night, turn into our commentary. And that's how we emotionally engage an audience. And, you know, getting back to what I was saying before, my ability to be able to do that and turn people you've maybe never heard of 
And I was always good at doing it when I was working in the US on smaller promotions like LFA and CES and, and Legacy and that. Guys who were regional shows you'd never heard of, making them sound like superstars, like yes. mega stars. And that, you know, that all came about mm. from, from this. Oh, you know? I, when I was growing up, I didn't know who the Red Rooster was. Oh, I didn't know who the Macho Man was or Rick Rude was. Yeah. I heard a storyline about them. You know, Ted DiBiase yeah. storyline. I believed it. Yes. And that's the thing, you, you, you got a story tell. Ravishing Rick Rude, Mr. Perfect, oh. the Texas oh. Tornado, yeah. Kerry Ryan Eric. Andrew Hart, another one I loved, you know, just there were so many of them Andre the Giant and Hacksaw Jim Duggan and Haku and Jake the Snake and yeah. uh, Rick Martel. I could keep going. Rick the Model Martel, yeah. Some of the, some of the favorites. The fact you haven't said the British, Bulldog, British Bulldogs disappoints me, so uh, I guess I should say that. Yeah, I was going to get to the Bulldog, Davy Boy Smith. Yes, indeed. But you know what? He was a little bit one dimensional in regards to his style. Um, the power yeah, slam. Uh, him, the, him and the Dynamite Kid, and uh, mm. what a what a team though with Matilda, their British Bulldog. Yes, um, I, I, I remember even being so upset when Bobby Heenan stole Matilda. I mean, just the way they could convey those stories. I mean, yeah. being upset because a manager steals a dog. a dog, you were emotionally invested, and that was the beauty about wrestling back then. Yeah, we didn't know we scripted. We got into the characters. We let our imaginations run free, and we did it. And that's how I, you know, that's how I actually started commentating and. Um, you know, after I watched WrestleMania 1, I would go outside and hit a tennis ball against the wall because I loved playing tennis too. And I hit a ball against the wall at home and I'd commentate wrestling matches in my head out loud. Okay. Right? And my mum remembers this. She remembers hanging, washing on the line and listening to me commentate imaginary wrestling matches with my own wrestlers, my own leagues, my own matches and titles all from my head out loud in the backyard. And that's why... When it came years later to do work experience and I, I wanted to be an architect it's all i wanted to be growing up and no architecture firms wrote back to me and mum said you've got a good voice why don't you do radio i didn't know where it came from you know years later she'd say i used to listen to you in the backyard commentating these make-believe fights she goes you're good at it so it's just i even unknowingly back then i was i was commentating most high puts certain things in our path and in our hearts and we don't know what where that's going to lead but it clearly lead, led you to the point where you're at now it, it does you know and i, I heard a saying once in a, a movie and i'm not sure what movie it was from but it was the universe will always unravel as it should and sometimes you've just got to let it unravel and you know, as much as I pushed, and man, did I push to become an architect when I was young. The universe just said, no. Nah, yeah, that's not, not where you meant to go. Yeah, no. Not where you meant to go. Not where you meant to go. I got so upset over it, so upset over it, crying to my mum. No one's written back to me. I can't get a placement in architecture. And, you know, she said that. And so... I thought nothing of it when she said it to me. I was 15 and I rode away to a couple of radio stations I listened to just to shut my mum up. And one of the radio stations, Triple M Radio, big radio station in Australia, wrote back, you know, immediately and said, hey, come and do work experience with us. Wow. I still have the letter at home. The letter is dated April 10, 1990, my birthday. Wow. So it's one of the serendipitous things. I printed this letter in my other book, which is called Goodnight Irene, which is available now from all good booksellers. Um, I printed the letter in that book. You can see it. I put it in there in the photo section. So it's just one of those serendipitous things that that was the direction I was meant to take. Mm. So you're a you know, when I, was, when, I was born, when, I was, when I was born, um, you know, family and friends come to the hospital to visit the parents and see the newborn baby. And um, an aunt of mine, was the first one to visit me and the first present I ever got, first baby gift I ever got in my life in the hospital, hours after I was born. It wasn't a pair of baby booties. It wasn't a little jumper. It wasn't something knitted. It wasn't a stuffed teddy or anything. <laughs> it was a pair of blue plastic boxing gloves. Wow. I still have those little plastic boxing gloves at home. First present I ever got in my life. So, you know, when I tell people the universe is taking you somewhere yeah 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 you know, it's it's and sometimes it, 
say one more freaky thing. <laughs> so you all know that I say and I scream, good night, Irene. Yes. When a submission happens. It's my famous catch cry. I've been screaming good night, Irene, since I started commentating track and field as a 15 or 16 year old. I did it all throughout my early fight sports career, my 20s, in my 30s, screaming good night, Irene. When I was 34 years old, I end up meeting a girl of all names called Irene, who I ended up marrying. <laughs> well, of all the names, <laughs> of all the names in all the world that the universe could bring me to marry that I'd fall in love with, it had to be a name I'd been screaming for almost 20 years. <laughs> and it's not like Irene is a common name. Not at all. Not at all. A quite yeah. old-fashioned name, I, I would say. Definitely not a name that's used regularly. Um, so a lot of freaky coincidences. And I, you know what? No, I'm not even going to put it down to freaky coincidences. I'm going to put put it down to a higher power. Yeah. Uh, you know, pushing my boat in a certain direction. Yep. Yeah. No such thing as coincidences, maybe synchronicity, but coincidence, no. It's it it was written. It was written. Mm -hmm. Where where did we sort of coin that moniker? Good night, Irene. <laughs> so one of my favorite wrestlers used to be adorable Adrian Adonis. Adonis. Adorable Adrian Adonis had a finishing move, a sleeper hold called the Good Night Irene. First time I ever heard it called was when Gorilla Monsoon said, you know, something along the lines of, oh, you know, Adrian the, puts on the good night, Irene, and it stuck with me. And when I first started commentating track and field, as I said, as a 15-year-old, I think it was in 1991, um, I blurted out good night, Irene, as someone crossed the finish line in one of the races. And when I did my first kickboxing commentary uh, as a in 1994 as a 20-year-old, and a knockout happened, I blurted out good night, Irene, and it, it stuck. <laughs> simple as that. <laughs> yeah, it's, simple and it's permeated uh, totally through your life to the point where you are now yeah. married. To an Irene. It's, and the thing is, the funny thing, I've never said good night, Irene, to my own wife. And when we started going, it was funny because when we started going out, uh, you know, she didn't know what I did. She knew I worked in, in media and, and stuff. And as you do, you know, you Google someone you're dating and do your due diligence on them yes. online. And, you know, I told her that I, I was a commentator and she looked me up on YouTube and she heard all these videos of this guy. She'd started dating, screaming, good night, Irene. And she freaked out. And she went and told her friends, um, I really like this guy, but it's freaky because I think he's, I've just dated him like once or twice and he's screaming my name on all these video clips. I think he's a freak. So I had to literally tell her and prove to her, no, 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 no. I've been saying this for almost 20 years. Please, it's not just some freaky thing because of you. And, you know, I, I allayed her fears. But, yeah, it's, it's one, one of those things. <laughs> Michael's that infatuated with me. He's using my name in commentary. <laughs> I would be too, man. If I was dating a girl and all of a sudden she's like, good night, Michael, on all these things on YouTube, I'd be like, what? That's no, what? You have a you have some no. effect, sir. You, so so your tenth of April. Are you a Taurian? Then I take it. I'm an Aryan. Same birthday as Steven Seagal. Ah. Okay. Jackie Chan is April seven. Steven Seagal and I are April ten. Mm -hmm. Musically, what well, what kind of what what kind of genre of music are we into, uh, Michael? I'm not a big music fan. You know what? I just am not. And the rate on the car, I listen to talk radio. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the funny thing is in the car, <laughs> I listen to a radio station called SEN in Australia, which is a horse racing station. And I listen to the horse races. I'm not a horse racing fan. I don't bet. I don't care. Mm -hmm. But I like listening to horse racing commentary. And I really appreciate the hell out of horse race callers. I think it's one of the most hardest events or sports for a, a guy to commentate is horse racing. So I listen to horse racing commentary in my car when I'm driving around because it's on all day, all the different meets from all over the country and international meets on this radio station. I just like listening to the calls of the commentators. Music-wise, I really can't tell you because, man, if my go-to is to put something on now, my go-to would be either the Gypsy Kings 
or old WWF theme songs, really, is what I've got loaded on my phone that I listen to before a show. But I'm not a music guy. I'd much rather listen to a, a good radio show. Um, not, not a music guy. Okay, okay. That's all good. That's all good. I, I, I hear the influence, and as you say, so the, 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 the intros and walkout theme musics to this day... <laughs> still bring a smile to my face and you, you you hear the first three seconds of it and you can it just transport you back to the time yeah it does you know you hear like when it comes crashing down and it hurts inside and you think hulk hogan you think the titan tron you know and the thing is that if i listen to that stuff before a show which is really the only time i might listen to music um it transports me to that place to that part of my childhood, which then connects me to Gorilla Monsoon, who I grew up loving, and Vince McMahon and those great commentators. And then I feel that spark inside of me. So it's sort of like, it helps with my, my commentary. Um, yeah, you know, my wife and I are opposite there. She's a big music fan, she loves music. Me, no, I'd rather listen to, to sports commentary. And I don't really care about the sport, put whatever on, it can be yeah. darts, it can be horse racing, it can be curling, I don't care. But if it's a commentary, I like to listen to the commentary sorted this is this is the um the wonders of the of, of humanity and being um individuals you know um last two questions for you sir last two questions for you um have you had fun today i've had a ball this has been a really nice interview thank you it's been different uh it's been very well conducted and um which is a credit to you because once again I, I do want to say and i know that a lot of people watch these radio shows and podcasts and listen to them and they're doing their own shows but um again and i'm not blowing wind up your proverbial but i can tell that you're refined in your art and you've practiced your art and your eloquence your pronunciation your ability to segue and your ability to stay with me when i'm going off on tangents which is really difficult to do for an interviewer and your ability not to inject yourself too much but to let me the guest do the talking because it's a common problem a lot of rookies make and amateurs make is that they'll interview someone but they'll talk about themselves. That's like, I'm not watching an interview to hear you talk. I want to hear your guest talk. When I did the Voice Versus series on Access TV and I interviewed Hulk Hogan, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Dana White, Joe Rogan, uh, Michael Jai White, Fedor Emelianenko, Steven Seagal, etc. The thing was that I had my questions. I asked my questions. I listened to my guest. And it's the most important thing and one of the hardest things to do. And not try and inject yourself in there. So I, I give you credit for that. And uh, it's it's a, it's a lesson that I think a lot of people who are doing this sort of thing need to learn. Thank you very much for the uh, the high compliments, sir. The whole mission statement for um, doing these interviews is to number one highlight the human experience. Number two, to allow the guests to tell their story, and in telling their story trustfully, you know, some of the listeners will have affinity in certain points and think that's helped me i can use that that's actually inspirational or i'm going through that section now you know so it's all about the the the, the wider picture and 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 i thank you for that it's, it's easy to sit here and talk about fights and who's going to win this fight and what did you think about that fight but eh, it's been done to death you can read about that stuff on the internet you know but to open up and talk and be able to share part of my life and be able to share lessons that i've learned even if someone only takes one of my sentences away from this very long chat yeah. um, and use it in their life to help them achieve something, to help them get out of a rut, to help them improve themselves or improve others, um, you know, that, that makes it it's so worthwhile. Definitely. Each one that teach 12, as I say. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Very last one for you, sir. We've, we've had a, as you say, a very in-depth um wide conversation about yourself i think people now know uh, more than a little bit about you as a as an individual versus a, as, a, as a presenter and color commentator um please tell us who you are but don't tell us your name sir i am a father of two amazing young boys who are my absolute angels and the love of my life I am the husband of a woman who constantly amazes me and makes me smile at the very thought of her. I am the son of two incredibly hardworking parents and a very dedicated and caring mother. And 
I am someone who I hope that everybody can approach and who hopefully I can leave a legacy on their lives. Excellent, excellent. And very lastly, please throw out all of your social medias. I'll make sure I put links below in the description and any website information or anything else you'd like to uh, promote, sir. No, thank you again. Follow me on Twitter uh, at Chevelo Voice. I'm on Instagram, on Facebook, or you know, LinkedIn, all the usual places. Uh, check out my new book. It's just gone for pre-order now uh, in the UK, in the US, Australia, wherever you are. It's called The Commentators. Uh, this year, 2021, is the 100th year anniversary of the profession of sports commentary. It started in 1921. This book celebrates those last 100 years of the sports commentary. So many of your favorite sports moments are in there. Your favorite commentators are in there. Every sport you can think of is in there. It's 320 pages. Grab a copy of the commentators right now. Pre-order it. Don't miss out. You're going to love it. And, uh, you know, I really hope you enjoy it. And again, thanks for having me on uh, CFR Radio today. It's, it's been an absolute treat. I love it. Let's do it again. Most definitely. Sir. And thank you very much for, for, for giving me your time to impart and tell your story and give some jewels and, and nuggets um, of, of, of um, life experience. If this is the first time you have all tuned in, Please like, comment, subscribe, share, tell a friend to tell a friend, to tell another family member to tune in. If you're listening to the old podcast review, five stars would be would be much appreciated. Um, and there will be more. Like King Kong Bundy used to say, five, five. <laughs> Give us five. Five. <laughs> All the links will be, be below. Thank you again for your time, kind sir.